was so cool this uh, theme at what East Campus is a little different than at West Campus so if you can go to both of them if you want next year um, when we have Vacation Bible School again it was Athens Athens was the title of it and it talked about Paul going through and teaching about Jesus Christ to all the people and his wonderful journey through that and people coming to know Jesus Paul getting brought before um, before the councils and really standing up for the faith. I liked this one. I would do this one again um, because it really talked about how we come to faith and then how we live that out. What does it look like for a believer in Jesus Christ to live out their faith in Jesus Christ? And today I get to tell you a little bit about Paul preaching in Athens and where he preached was on a place called, well now they call it Mars Hill. And um, he went to the temples but he also went out not just to the temples where the priest were but he went out to where other people who didn't believe in Jesus and that was kind of unique that he didn't go to the temple but that he went out amongst where the people were and I have an even bigger picture that kind of shows Mars Hill here and um, I want to read this for you but I didn't put it up on the screen so you can kind of see where Paul would maybe be preaching here and a little bit of what happened um, I'm just going to read a little bit that talks about what happened to Paul here in Acts 17. So if you've got your Bibles or you can read it later in Acts 17. It says, Paul was waiting for the others at Athens and his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. And then he went to the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And there were all these different philosophers who would visit with him out there in the marketplace. Or up here, maybe on this rock here at Mars Hill. Um, a little further down in 17 it says, When these people heard about the resurrection of the dead, when they heard about Jesus Christ, some of them mocked. Paul. That was their reaction. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And they wanted to know more. So Paul went out from their midst and some men joined him and they believed. And among those believers were Dionysius and a woman named Damaris and there were others who were with them. Uh, I kind of skipped over some of the story of what, G what Paul shared with them, but we're going to get to that here today as well. I want to share with you that story, especially at the end. But I want to talk a little bit about how they were responded to the story because how the people of Athens responded is a lot like how we respond when we hear shocking stories when we hear news that kind of challenges us as well we respond very similar to the people of Athens because the people of Athens they were a university town they were very well educated we're pretty well educated too um, in our uh, well just in in all the state of Nebraska and the United States, really. Um, we have pretty high education. Our kids know a lot. A lot of us go to college. A lot of us um, get further degrees, PhDs. Um, here in Athens, these were all the smarty pants PhDs. They knew a lot of stuff. And so um, some of them, priests in, in the temples heard Jesus's or heard Paul's message about Jesus. But then there were others out in the marketplace who were unbelievers. And that was unique, to go to the unbelievers and to tell them about this. But what Paul thought was amazing was here's all these intelligent people who've been to lots of schools, um, they know a lot of philosophies, um, they learn a lot of things, they don't believe in God, but they follow a whole bunch of idols. It was just bizarre that here are these highly intelligent people, um, don't believe in the true God, but they love to hear about the next best thing. <laughs> What's the next best idol? What's the next best God? What's the next best self-help book from Oprah's book club? <laughs> you know, this is something we kind of understand when we look for the next best thing in the world to help our life go. That's what these people did. They looked for that next best thing. That's what they were up to. So Paul could comes here he preaches to them at first they're a little worried that maybe he's a dangerous guy but their academics kind of get the better of them and they just want to hear more this is a pretty cool story that Paul's telling them and it's shocking it's not like any of those other gods it's not like any of those other idols this is a God who sends a piece of himself Jesus Christ his son to earth to live and then to die and then to rise from the dead I mean, they want to hear now all of the gory details. They want to hear everything about that. That's how they respond. And then it's even more shocking when he tells them, this is a free gift, and you don't have to do anything. 
to deserve it. You don't have to do anything to earn it. It's just because God loves you. And they want to hear more. And some come to believe. Some mock it. But the way that they respond with this shocking news of just kind of like, we're so curious. Tell us more. I just need to hear more about um, more gods, more idols, you know. Give us all the gory details about how Jesus died and then he rose from the dead. That's amazing. It reminds me of me. It reminds us of how we respond to news articles. I remember the um, June 17th, 1994. <laughs> I remember that date um, when I was glued to the TV along with 95 million other Americans. So it could have been you. You might have been watching the NBA Game 5 finals and you got this came on the TV instead, so it made your little basketball game go down in the corner of the screen, and instead this was the giant part where Tom Brokaw, for two hours, we followed this, 95 million of us. Nothing happened. <laughs> it was just a car chase. Nothing even happened. <laughs> um, we watched O.J. Simpson run from the police. And we'll never forget what that white Bronco meant. That's amazing. They had over 20 helicopters, news media, everybody watching this thing. And there was so much um, news coverage that the signals crossed somehow. And the wrong TV stations would be on the wrong station somehow over all of their signals. It was just crazy. And we're all watching this thing. And we want to see what happens at the end. Uh, it's kind of our culture. It's very similar to back then in Athens, this culture of we need to hear what's going to happen. It's entertainment for us and nothing more. We forget about the horribleness. We forget about what happened to begin this whole charade, this whole story. Instead, people go up on all those overpasses and they've got big signs and they're cheering him on. And you forget about what started this whole police chase. You forget about all those things. It's a high. It's like a news high. Um, they even talked about after how 9-11, people who watched the news, who maybe didn't know anybody in New York City, but others who just watched the news so much got post-traumatic stress disorder because they watch too much news. And I was reading through the different psychology paper things that they have online, like Psychology Today, and they have whole studies on anxiety and how watching the news gets your anxiety up and gets your endorphins going. It's like a high. And we have to hear the next best thing. Is that a way to respond to sin? Is that a way to respond to Jesus Christ's death? Is that a way we respond? In Acts 17, 21, I didn't read this for you, but it says all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend all their time in nothing except telling or hear something new. It was just entertainment for them. When they heard this news story, some mocked it. We do that too. Pick apart all those horrible news stories. And, and then it's not so horrible in, anymore when we just kind of pick everything apart and dissect it a little bit and mock all the people who were involved in some really bad things. And then the horribleness no longer touches us. We get a little desensitized to all this, even the most gut-wrenching stories. But the thing with God's word is, is even though they responded in this way, some of the Athenians, you know, they just wanted to hear the, the next entertaining news, uh, God's word goes out and doesn't come back um, not doing exactly what God wants it to do. Some people actually came to believe. Paul gave them logical arguments. Apologetics is what, that, is what that's called. And he reasoned with them. And some people heard this message and they, God's word just honed right into their hearts. Like Dionysius and Damaris and others with them. And they believed in Jesus Christ. So... We know that this is true of us, too, that sometimes we respond uh, to shocking news. We respond to sometimes our sins uh, by just, you know, obsessing about them. Or um, we can obsess about a lot of things. But others will respond to the story of Jesus Christ or even their sins by just ignoring it all. 
Maybe if we ignore it, it'll go away. Because sometimes these things are painful a little bit. When we think that that's how much our sins are bad, that God had to give his son Jesus to die for us, that kind of hurts a little bit to think about it for me. So let's just ignore that. Or my sins that bother me, let's just pretend that they're not even happening. And let's just ignore all these things. I think of this um, recent news uh, article these last few months with this trial down in Florida. And I... I sympathize, really sympathize with this one um, witness who was this girl, she was on the phone and she was, didn't want to go to the funeral, she didn't want to be a witness in public, and who could blame her because she knew it would be a spectacle, and it was. It was a total spectacle. And if you don't want to be <laughs> mocked, you wouldn't want to be there, and she was mocked, just as scripture, you know. Not much has changed in 2,000 years with how we react to all these shocking, amazing stories of sin or about the consequences of our sin or even about Jesus Christ and God's love for us. Sometimes we mock it. Sometimes we ignore it. Let's just pretend as if all the unpleasantness never even happened and let it go away. Now, even the disciples wanted to do this when they heard about what was going to happen to Jesus. It says in Matthew 16, Jesus is starting to tell them what is going to happen. I mean, he flat out tells them. In Matthew 16, Jesus tells the disciples and begins to show them that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So Jesus is starting to show them this, teach them this, that this will happen. Jesus will die. He will be raised again from the dead. And the way that Peter responds, I just love this. Peter says, no, no. And actually, scripture says Peter rebukes Jesus. Yikes. Peter rebukes Jesus and says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You can't ignore it. Uh... Somebody said that um, Satan doesn't need you to worship him. He just needs you to take your eyes off of Jesus, to take your eyes off of God. That's what's happening here. Peter is putting his eyes now on all sorts of other things. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're not, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man on all those things that you want to worry about, on all the things of this earth, and you're not thinking about what must happen for your eternal salvation of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's true. When we ignore sin, when we ignore reality, and when we're not honest, then we also miss how God's grace breaks into that sin and that pain and how God does amazing things and miracles to save us. I don't want to miss that goodness that comes from God. So here's two ways we can respond to the story of Jesus, or we can respond to sin. We can respond by either um, just becoming kind of obsessed, you know, looking for the next big thing. It's just entertainment to us. Or we can ignore sin completely. And um, if those aren't the right answers, just becoming obsessed or completely ignoring it, where does the right answer come from? And here's where I have just a fun little aside story. Um, happened to me when I was in seminary. Um, it's graduate school. Um, if you want to go to be a pastor, uh, and you know, seminary doesn't really work like this anymore, but um, it's kind of changing and morphing and growing a little bit. But when I went, you leave um, the church and you go to the school for three to four years and you're not in church, you're just learning learning from professors who are not pastors themselves. It's kind of an odd thing to become a pastor by learning from people who aren't pastors. So we don't really do that anymore. Um, so there I was, and we were talking about sin, and how do we address sin with all these things, you know, some people wanting to ignore it, some people just wanting to dissect it. What resources do we have to deal with it? And my first advisor, who... Uh, our relationship was short-lived. <laughs> our fir my first advisor, we were sitting there and somebody asked, what resource do we have to talk about sin? And naively, I put my hand on the Bible and I said, well, the Bible helps us deal with sin. And the professor said, April, it's just not in there. So here's your bonus lesson. Not all PhD smart people <laughs> are right. <laughs> but God's word is. So I want to turn to that to find what Jesus has to say about dealing with sin. What does Jesus have 
have to say when we hear the message of why he came to die for us. What does Jesus do about all these things that cause us pain and hurt us and our sin? What does Jesus do to respond to that? One of my favorite stories of Jesus' response is Matthew 21. Now that Jesus told the disciples he was going to go to Jerusalem, and he was going to be picked on by all the elders, the scribes. He was going to go through horrible trials. He was going to die. He told them this was going to happen, so now he goes. And now here he is in the temple, and he goes to the temple where all the scribes and the elders are. And what he finds there is all these people selling things, um, taking other people's money, really fleecing them, you know, really being robbers for them. It's kind of like almost like a gift shop inside the temple, sort of, but people are selling sacrifices, kind of like they're selling indulgences, and they're selling idols, and they're really robbing poor people of their money and using, using the temple to do it. So Jesus comes in, and what could he do? If it was 2013, here's what he could do. He could go find the temple priest, um, make a complaint, visit with him, and then, then maybe he could write up a formal um, request. He could submit it to the council. The council will meet on the second Tuesday of every month. And uh, then he could go and you know have an audience with them. They can sit down and talk about it. And maybe the council will agree with them and take a vote. And that's what we would do in 2013. Back then... And some people don't like this story. When Jesus faced all of this sin, it says in Matthew 21, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He got mad. <laughs> some people don't like this story and they really want to ignore that Jesus ever got mad. Well, he got mad at sin. He got mad at people encouraging sin. He got mad at people hurting other people and taking their money. And Jesus said, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Som and sometimes um, we don't like to think about Jesus coming right after our sin this specifically. But he does. And he did. And that's how Jesus responds to sin. He deals with it. Honestly. Sin is not ignored by God. God does not mock your sin. He doesn't let it keep going, but Jesus deals with it. We're tempted either to just kind of keep getting high and obsess with all of our sin or to ignore it all, but God deals with it. And this is the shocking message that Paul came and stood up on Mars Hill and gave to the people was this story. It's a big difference. They'd only been thinking in these other two ways before. They'd only been looking for that next tie, or they'd been ignoring all the problem. But now here comes Paul, and he's got an amazing, shocking story for them about God. And here it is. He says, God loves you so much. He created you as his children to be in relationship with him. The God of Father of all who created heaven and earth, created you specifically, knows your name, knew you before you were born, knows the number of hairs on your head, and loves you. And he loves you so much. When he created you, he didn't want you to be a puppet. He wanted to give you a gift and give you a mind and give you a heart and a soul. And you have the ability to make choices and you can, you have your own will. You can do things. And we, as God's children, have rebelled against our creator. And we've sinned. And sin has entered into our lives. It's entered into the lives of our children. And now sin is everywhere in the world. It's everywhere. We deal with it every day. Pain, death, temptation, consequences of other people's sin. Every day we deal with this fallen world. But God, even though you rebelled against him, he does not give up on you. First, we rebel against our parents. I watch my son growing up, and he's starting to rebel against me already. And then we rebel against the laws of the land. Um, you know, I'm riding in my car, and I see the cop coming behind me, and I put my foot on the brake, and I wasn't even speeding. But, you know, you just know that you could have been. Um, you know, and then you rebel against your God because I got a little bit more education. I know more now. I don't need it. A God. I don't need a creator. I don't need a savior. I got this. And then it gets a little bit easier to mock sin, to ignore sin, to just get 
obsessed with sin and you can't get yourself out of any of those things when you're obsessing with it or you're ignoring it. But God loves you so much that even though you rebelled against him, he doesn't give up on you. And this is the crazy part of the story that the Athens people, when they were hearing it, it shocked them. It shocks me that God loves you so much he gave a piece of himself, his own son. And I have a son, and I can't imagine this, that God gave his son to be born into this world to die and then rise again from the dead so that your rebellion could be wiped clean and forgiven and that you could have the door to heaven opened for all those who believe in him. That's how much God loves you. It's a shocking story because the world does not give love like that. The world has consequences. The world condemns you. I heard a wonderful quote this last week where somebody said the thing here at, um, the thing about the church is that this is a place where we can be completely honest because honesty brings salvation and not condemnation. That is not the way the world works, but it is the way that God works. Honesty brings salvation before Jesus Christ. Paul simply preached this. John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him.